Number four. I pass by the gym. No need to see what I already saw every day. The restaurant style kitchen was next. Stainless steel pots and pans in every size hung from the ceiling above a long butcher block style counter. Two ovens sat side by side in one wall. They were the Hansel and Gretel type, big enough to shove a good sized witch inside. Three stainless steel coolers with clear glass doors lined another wall. It seemed like overkill to have such a massive kitchen for just our family, not like we'd be throwing any parties. The other end of the kitchen held the breakfast nook and the counter. Past them was the door into the dining room. One large crystal chandelier lit the room, which housed an oak dining table with seating for 16. Again, overkill. We ate Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Easter dinner in there. That was it. I left the kitchen and headed to the infirmary. Although it was state of the art, it looked like an old fashioned doctor's office when the doctor had a small place and did everything in one room. It smelled like antiseptic, like a hospital. White cabinets with glorid doors lined one wall, holding bandages, medicines, and other supplies. Two hospital beds were set up on one side. I pushed aside a curtain divider. Behind it were several machines. I knew the one was an EKG machine, but the rest I was unsure of. I assumed my dad had been trained on all of them at some point, otherwise why have them? Every room in the compound also held a defibrillator. It didn't make much sense to me. If one of us was going to check out, why not let us go? If we truly had a heart problem, there was no one to do surgery on us. What could a defibrillator buy us? A few minutes? I looked over the medicine cabinet. It wasn't locked, despite having a lot of controlled sus substances inside. I don't know who, if anyone, ever took them. Dad told us never to touch any of them. That was all he had to do. The one quality the Yanakakis kids did have in common was obedience. I switched off the lights before I left. The beauty salon was next. I didn't ever go in there. Definitely a girl place. In the old world, I'd been dragged along a few times when my mom went, so I knew that everything, what everything was. The smell of nail polish remover made me cover my nose. In front of a mirror counter sat a hair cutting stall with a nearby hair dryer. I looked in the mirror and saw a face. I jumped and then felt stupid when I saw what it was. A nearby shelf held a row of practice heads, plastic heads with real hair. I excelled, surprised at myself for being so on the edge. There were also two pedicure chairs with attached foot baths. A manicured table sat nearby, and glass shelves filled with bottles of nail polish ran along one whole wall. I shook my head and backed out the door. The laundry and sewing room was next. The room had a bleachy smell. Stacked washer-dryer units were lined up next to one another, next to large sinks. One of the dryers was running, and something metallic clicked every time the clothes flipped. Across from them was a long table that held several types of sewing machines. Thick bolts of fabric were piled on shelves behind the table. Boring. I shut the door and moved on. Through the glass door of the da dance studio, I saw Lexi practicing ballet. Her hair was twisted in a dancer's top knot, and she wore a black leotard and pink toe shoes. Her wardrobe was slightly more extensive than mine. In the old world, she attended a performing arts school where she studied both ballet and piano. Since Eddie and I went to a Chinese immersion school on the other side of the city, our schedules were different enough that I really only saw Lexi during summer vacation. Before the compound, anyway. I stood there watching for a while. She danced with the confidence she never showed other times. Lexi tended to cover up her insecurities with her lousy attitude. My reasoning was her being insecure came from being adopted. From how she treated us, though, you'd think she didn't give a crap about any of us. Except Dad. He could do no wrong where she was concerned, and he ate it up all her attention, like he didn't already have people groveling at his feet every day. Lexi would never go against Dad. It was a little ridiculous, really, how she went along with everything he said. Mom had no sway with her. I hated that Lexi could get Dad to go against Mom's wishes, wishes just to please her, his oldest daughter. Still, I did like to watch Lexi dance. Even at her school recitals, Eddie and I would quit fidgeting when she was on stage. As I watched her through the door, there was something about the long lines of her lithe body, the strengths of her jumps, and the grace of her move movements. She seemed so focused, so lost in the dance, like nothing else existed. I wished there were something like that for me, 
something more than free throws and tai chi that I could get lost in. Lexi stopped when she noticed me and stood with one hand on her jutted out hip, the other holding up a middle finger. Acknowledging her greeting with a wave, I called out in Mandarin, Si San Ba. Years ago, I told her it was an affectionate term for a big sister. I'd have to find a new phrase if she ever discovered that, what nasty word it actually meant. On my way once more, I passed the rock climbing wall and media room. Next door was the music studio. Mom was playing cello, so I slipped in, sinking to the floor to listen. Mozart. Her back was to me, and her long hair hung straight down in an even plate. My mother was the gentlest person I ever met, gentle in her manner, her voice, her touch. I imagine that Clea Sheridia Yanakakis had never mustered up even an iota of bad feeling toward anyone. However, her gentle nature didn't mean she wasn't intense. One only had to watch her play cello for a short while to understand her depth. You don't have to be loud or forceful to take up a lot of space in the world. Her mother wasn't as quiet, quiet or as gentle. Graham was part Hawaiian and half Chinese, along with an eighth each of overbearing and opinionated. We loved her, of course, even though her demeanor wasn't anything like mom's. Graham was, way, was that way for a reason. As she told it, at one time she was as quiet as mom. She married a music professor, had mom, and was quite content. Their blissful life changed when mom was five and her dad was killed in a car accident. From what I knew, he left them with insufficient funds and Graham was lonely. In addition, she thought mom would have a, should have a male influence. Graham remarried, a man whose name I never knew. The whole story never came my way, just bits through closed doors when I was supposed to be asleep, merged with things Eddie and Lexi heard. Putting them together, we determined the guy was a loser, demanding and scheming toward Graham, verbally abusive toward Mom. Graham finally kicked him out, even though it left her strapped for money once again. Mom came out of it quiet and sensitive, but she was not without resources. She had inherited her father's talent for music. I love to listen to her, especially moments like this, when she didn't know she had an audience. Somehow she seemed freer, more at ease, a way she never seemed around my dad. She set her bow aside for a moment to switch sheet music. I ducked down in case she turned around. She started again. Debussy. The music gave me goosebumps. Even if she had been completely void of talent, she still would have taken away people's breaths with her looks. I saw it in their eyes whenever she came to one of my school events. Oh, at first the teachers and the other parents were always disappointed when my dad didn't show up, but I think mom ended up being more interesting to them. Her father's Irish and Scottish background had combined with Graham's ancestry, leaving mom with dark hair, deep green eyes, and slightly Polynesian features. She walked in the room in her expensive clothes. Classic, elegant, never flashy, but still she'd stand out. I was proud that I had the prettiest mom. Funny, we had all inherited mom's looks, except Eddie and I had brown eyes like Graham. Even though Lexi was adopted, she had the same dark hair as mom. None of us looked like my dad with his fair features. At least the four of us didn't. As for the ones in the yellow room, I couldn't say. I'd never seen them. Trying not to make any noise as I stood up, I left without revealing my presence. In the carpeting section of the compound, there was only one room left, the chapel. For as long as I could remember, my dad had been adamant about our church going. During my childhood, unless we were dying or close to it, our butts were in a Methodist pew every Sunday. I knew more Bible verses than any kid had a right to, and I'm sure the church loved getting my father's tights. The minister certainly seemed pleased to see us arrive every Sunday. Even in the compound, we remembered the Sabbath day and kept it holy. For the first several years, each Sunday, as well as Christmas Eve, Dad delivered a brief sermon. We sang a few hymns as Lexi accompanied us on the organ. Then Mom read some Bible verses. Those terse mo moments of religion were sufficient enough to feel that God was with us in the compound. We never had any reason to doubt that he was. And then, with no explanation, Dad quit holding chapel services, just like he quit working out. So I hadn't been in there for a while. The chapel had four rows of card wooden pews facing a small altar with a wooden pulpit. A large gold cross hung on the wall behind the pulpit and an organ sat off to one side. Heavy purple curtains framed the setting, and except for the small size, it looked much like the church we attended in Seattle. It felt strange to be in there alone. 
The room was so hushed and empty. I stepped onto the pulpit. I'd never been up there before. Dad's Bible was on top, and I opened it. A sheet of blue paper, blue lined paper, fell out. In Dad's handwriting was a list of several items regarding banking and stocks. The title was composed of two words: "Tell Phil." Tell Phil. Why would Dad have a note to his accountant sitting in his Bible? The date was a few months ago, but the year must have been wrong. It was old, of course. Had to be. Guess he needed to be reminded of the old world as much as we did. Or maybe he'd done it on purpose. Written a note to his accountant like he did in the old world a dozen times a day. Maybe he needed to pretend in order to feel a little normal in once in a while, just like I did. I put the note back where I found it. A cursory search of the rest of the room revealed nothing. Not that I knew what I was looking for. I left. At the end of the, car of the carpeted section of the compound stood a double door. As I stepped through, a rush of air hit me. The ceiling was 25 feet over my head. The entire space went as far as I could see, see to see my sides and front, and was open except for various walls and doors every now and then. A warehouse. There were storage areas, shelves that stretched all the way to the ceiling, and the freezers, 20 of them. I hopped into the golf cart, sitting near the door, and drove, stopping randomly at one of the storage rooms. I opened the door. Of course I'd been in all of them before times, to get toilet paper or laundry detergent. Had I ever really considered how Dad had done it all? The compound itself must have taken years to build, not even counting all the planning. How do you know how much toilet paper you'll use in 15 years? Also, how could you project? How could a project like this, headed up by my dad, not make it on CNN? If I had worked on the compound, then found out we were under attack, this is the place, first place I would have headed. The answer was probably money, which Dad had loads of power too. He probably made everyone sign a confidentiality agreement and paid them a lot to do so. It was sort of a constant in the old world. My father had the means to get whatever he wanted. That was just how things were, and we all knew it. I glanced at my watch and realized I was late for chores, so I headed to the very back of the compound. My main job was to run the hydroponic garden, an enormous open room where vegetables grew in troughs of water, relying on artificial sunlight to grow more rapidly than in traditional soil gardens. I'd learned about hydroponics at a local co-op when we went to every Saturday on the outside. While I learned how to grow vegetables, Eddie learned about livestock and poultry. My mom learned how to bake bread, canned vegetables, part of dad's planning. I'd come to realize that we'd all have a role in the subsistence world of the compound. The tom tomatoes, lettuce, and red bell peppers were close to another harvest. I started some more seedlings by pushing seeds into small squares of sponges. One row of grow light bulbs flickered. I held my breath. They came back on, stayed on. I breathed again, re relieved. After nine months in the compound, some bulbs had gone out. I replaced them, but the light didn't look the same. After checking the storage room with the supply of grow light bulbs, I found a nasty surprise. More than three-fourths of them were normal fluorescent bulbs, no good for growing anything. Depending on how long the, bulb, the grow bulbs lasted, our supply of vegetables would run out around the time I turned 18, if not sooner. So I had a good reason to panic every time those bulbs flickered, especially when I took into the account the rest of the food situation. And that was something I tried not to think about.